Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Really excited to chat with you today. And so I want to set the table before we get into our discussion about uh, what we need to do when it comes to taxation. Uh, we are today in Canada celebrating or not celebrating. This is uh, one of the uh, one of the worst uh, tragedies we've gone through in recent memory. We are commemorating the one year uh, anniversary of COVID-19 and it has been very difficult. It's been so hard on so many people. People have lost their jobs. People have lost their businesses. And we know many people have lost their lives. Uh, 22,000 Canadians have lost their lives here uh, over this pandemic. And we know that our seniors bore the brunt of it. And so when we're looking at how we move forward, how do we take better care of our seniors? How do we build a better healthcare system? How do we have a better social safety net to help people who lose their jobs? How do we provide the supports necessary for small businesses to succeed? How do we build a better country? And who pays for that? We look at the impacts of COVID-19 and it hasn't impacted everyone the same way. We know that the working people, that, that small businesses, that, that people every day have suffered and they have felt the pain of this. They've lost their jobs, lost their income. But the ultra wealthy, those at the very, very top have actually benefited and done well in this pandemic. We know that Canadian billionaires, the richest billionaires, uh, approximately 44, have become $63 billion richer over the pandemic. We know that uh, there are incredible examples of, of the wealth generated, not just profits, but record profits. Companies like Amazon have generated record profits, but don't pay effectively any tax in Canada. We know that, for example, the CEO of Shopify has more than doubled his wealth to over $15 billion. So there's significant wealth that, is, that has uh, grown for the wealthiest. The wealthiest have seen their wealth go increase. But workers uh, struggle. There was the largest decline in work, um, and we've seen massive job losses, and it's been very difficult. We've seen uh, in September of 2020, 1.1 million fewer people were employed in Canada compared to pre-COVID levels. There's been a significant impact to workers. And we know that the taxation system as it stands allows for the wealthiest to get away with not paying their fair share. The current system in Canada is a system rigged by both the Liberals and the Conservatives and designed very much to enrich and to benefit those at the very top. And uh, we know that this is, is bad for equality. It, it creates problems when it comes to how we invest in each other. And uh, we know that income inequalities in general create more polarization and anger. Uh, they, co they concentrate more wealth into fewer hands and creates uh, significant problems for our country. So when we look at the options we have in front of us, we know if we don't invest in people, the wealth will continue to concentrate in fewer hands. We've got an opportunity now to do something about that. The choices are very clear. Either in the past, governments in, in difficult times have cut services that people need, cutting health care, cutting the help that people need, or they put the tax burden on working people. That's what we've seen in the past. We have an opportunity now to do something different. Instead of putting the burden on people who've already suffered, and instead of cutting help to the people who need it, let's ask the very wealthiest, those at the very, very top, the ultra rich to pay their, pay their fair share. So we've got a proposal, uh, and I think it's the way to move forward, the way to invest in people to come out of this pandemic in a better way and to support people that have been hurt. We're proposing a 1% wealth tax on families who've got fortunes of over $20 million. Well, this would increase revenue by 70 billion over 10 years. We're also looking at ways to close tax loopholes and offshore tax havens, which effectively allow just the wealthiest, the very, very top, to hide their income, to make profits in Canada, but not pay taxes here. So we wanna close those loopholes. We wanna make sure web giants like Amazon, Google, Facebook, pay their fair share in Canada. They make profits here, let's make sure they pay their fair share. And uh, we've also proposed an idea of a temporary COVID-19 excess profit tax, similar to what happened in the World Wars, where companies that make massive profits should also contribute more in terms of the recovery and the cost of the pandemic. There are uh, leaders around the world that are also talking about fair taxation and how we can move forward. And I think often we can draw a lot of inspiration from what we hear around the world. So to talk about the movement around the world, 
from different perspectives around the world on how we can build a more fair taxation system or how we can make sure it's the wealthiest that actually bear the burden and not everyday people. I've got, uh, we've got here, uh, thank you to Broadband Institute and to all the great work done by the team. We've got an incredible panel. Uh, before I introduce the panel, I just wanna indicate we were initially gonna be joined by Lisa Nandy, the UK Shadow Secretary of State um, for uh, the um, Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs. She had a last minute emergent, family emergency and is not able to join us in this conversation. So she sends her regrets and, and we're sorry that she's not able to join us. But we have uh, Wolfgang Schmidt joining us. He is the State Secretary at the German Federal Ministry of Finance and a Social Democratic Party member of uh, the Bundestag. We also have Dr. Dr. Andrew Lee. He's a member of parliament and an Australian Labour member of the House of Representatives and the Australian Shadow Assistant Minister for Treasury and Charities. So first off, welcome Wolfgang and welcome Andrew. Hello, Jack Mate. Thanks so much for joining us. This is really exciting. Uh, I love when progressives around the world unite. So uh, I, want, I have a number of topics we want to get into. And so just to start off, let's talk a bit about where you think people are in your region. So where are people at when it comes to this idea of fair taxation? Is it something people are, are supportive of? Is there a willingness or an openness when it comes to people? Give us a bit of a sense of where people are. And maybe we can start with, uh, with Wolfgang. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's it's um, pretty much the same as everywhere. People people think that fairness, especially in taxation, is important, and um, that is why, for example, the idea of re-implementing um, a capital tax or net worth tax has uh, brought support of over seventy and eighty percent. Um, we have an upcoming election here in Germany. In September, we will decide upon who will follow uh, Mrs. Merkel after 16 years. Um, and obviously now we are in the process of um, drafting our election manifesto and tax will play a role. Nevertheless, we already have, because we have been in government or co-government uh, for some years now, we have a tax system that basically um, is fair and we have something to finance the um, cost of the German unification that it's called the solidarity tax or solidarity surcharge, which is a 5.5% um, add-on on the normal income tax and corporate tax. And in Germany, we just abolished for 90% of those who paid this solidarity surcharge. We abolished it and... Um, since January 1st, 90% of the, those people don't need to pay it. We still have it for the highest income earners, the highest 10%. And so my guess is that the election campaign will also be about getting rid of this or not. So the conservatives obviously, obviously want this solidarity tax to go away. And we as social democrats think that we need this um, money. It's actually 11 billion euro um, per year revenues out of a budget of 300 in normal non-COVID times, 360 billion. So it's quite substantial. And we think mm -hmm. that um, you can make use of this 11 billion in a better way to just give it away to the highest um, income earners. It makes a lot of sense. I really appreciate that. Thanks, Wolfgang. Uh, and then to give the Australian perspective, uh, Andrew, tell us a bit about where people are at in Australia and how they feel about this idea of tax fairness. Is there an openness to it? What do you What do you feel? I think there is, Jack, mate. Uh, can I start by thanking the Broadband Institute and acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of the lands on which I'm speaking to you from today. Uh, like Canada, we've seen a significant increase in inequality in Australia since the pandemic began. Uh, billionaires have increased their wealth around the world, but I can't find another place where the increase has been as stark as it has in Australia. Uh, there's been some 50% increase in the wealth of the average Australian billionaire, fueled in part by higher iron ore prices and also a surge in retail spending. And that's come off the back of a steady increase in inequality over the past generation, 
uh, when I was an economics professor, Tony Atkinson and I documented the rise in top income shares starting around 1980. Top 1% share has doubled, the top 0.1% share has tripled. Uh, and we've seen an increase in wealth inequality at the same time. Uh, I'm a uh, marathon runner and uh, one of the things about uh, marathons is uh, you don't uh, rise to the level of your aspirations, you fall to the level of your training. And so anything that we want to do needs to be something that we're able to train for and persuade the Australian people of. Uh, and we fell short on that in the 2019 election, an election where we did take to the Australian people a package of reforms uh, that included uh, a, a range of uh, highly progressive tax measures. So I suspect we'll take a, a somewhat more modest set of tax proposals to the next election uh, and we'll still be focused around closing tax loopholes. Uh, when I was uh, stu studying public finance, one of my professors was Marty Feldstein and Marty's a Republican, but I think he had something very wise to say on tax loopholes where he pointed out that closing them is more efficient than raising rates uh, and it's more equitable than cutting spending. Uh, so looking at uh, the, uh, the tax concessions that are provided, ensuring that they're fit for purpose and closing down those that are going disproportionately to the top is I think a really important social democratic agenda. And then there's the issue of tax havens. We now know about two fifths of the uh, profits of multinationals flow through tax havens where they rub shoulders with money from kidnappers, drug dealers, money launderers and the rest. And I think there's a great social democratic project in closing down tax havens uh, and ensuring that we have uh, greater uh, effectiveness of corporate tax rates uh, and that the uh, low tax or no tax jurisdictions uh, aren't able to effectively siphon, siphon off the profits of uh, large firms. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective, Andrew. I think there is absolutely a, a very basic sense of fairness that comes into play when people see the wealthiest get away with loopholes and tax havens. Uh, I, I remember having a same conversation with people and I said, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure no one in this room, we were at a town hall when we were allowed to have town halls. And I said, I'm pretty sure no one in this room uses tax havens or uh, tax loopholes um, to, to hide their money. If you do, let me know. And, you know, of course, no one put their hand up. Uh, and it's, it's something that really rings true for that feeling of fairness that why is it that the wealthiest who already have so much wealth are able to hide their wealth on top of it? So I really appreciate that. And just to answer the question from a Canadian perspective, we, we see actually very broad support in Canada for the idea of taxing the wealth uh, of the extremely wealthy, that that idea of, of a wealth tax is broadly supported. Recent poll came out that showed not only is it broadly su supported by Canadians, but when it was broken down into party affiliation, even uh, right wing or conservative, uh, centrist liberals and, and progressive New Democrats, uh, between all parties, there was a consensus that the vast majority believed in it. So there seems to be uh, at least a willingness or an openness to consider this and a, and a broad support for it, which is exciting. Um, any other perspectives before we move to the next topic, maybe from, from either anyone can feel to jump in, in terms of just the lay of the land right now and how people feel about taxation. I know sometimes it's a topic that, that has a potential to kind of have people start glossing their eyes over when we start talking about taxes. It doesn't really feel like it connects to people. I think the fairness works, but um, again, with people, do you think it's something that is, is a topic that is that resonates with folks in your regions? Um, and anyone can jump in on this one. Well, I think as Andrew put it, um, if I may start again, um, it's difficult to run a campaign on, on taxation and taxing. I mean, conservatives, conservatives all over the world always do is um, promising lower taxes. This is obviously quite um, popular. Um, even though people, when they think about it, they know that we need the money, public spending to finance schools. And especially after COVID, people have a notion that money is needed and good infrastructure and a robust state is needed. So I think as progressives, um, we should take this into consideration that taxes are not the most popular thing, even though there is a broad support of tax fairness and taxing the riches. 
Um, what, what we're going to try to do is focus more on what we need the money for. And um, so the investment agenda, um, connecting to, to people's everyday experience when it is about childcare or an infrastructure that is not working or broadband connections that is not fast enough. And then to talk about what we need the money for and how we're going to raise it. And I think it's also important for us as progressives to talk about, as Andrew said and you said, tax evasion, tax avoidance, tax fraud, um, but also about bad public spending. So we should not leave that to the conservatives in, in, in talking about when there is a waste of public money. And we very often see that um, with conservatives not running a proper government. And, and so I think with that, you have a compelling story. Um, I would be very cautious on, 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 on mainly relying on a story, a narrative that talks about increasing taxes. Somehow, even though you talk about the most wealthy, um, people still feel they might be in that position one day or they might be affected. And so I think your idea of saying, okay, the 1%, there you have a clear um, target and that um, might mitigate that risk. Right, right. Very good Thanks, point. Uh, Andrew, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree entirely with uh, Wolfgang's uh, political philosophy in this and the importance of making the case for how money will be, will be spent. Uh, we are in a moment of history where things are, are looking strong for progressives. You think about the great heroes of the conservative movement, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Uh, I can't imagine a politician standing up in any OECD country last year and saying, uh, government isn't the solution, government is the problem, as Reagan did. Or saying, there's no such thing as society, as Thatcher did. Uh, government was the solution and there was a great thing of, uh, of society. Uh, and so this is a moment where it's important for social democrats around the world to catgust and to look at how we're able to uh, uh, entrench uh, the right view of the world, uh, a notion of, uh, of government being able to, uh, to, to be out there and, and play an important role in improving people's lives. But to build on what Wolfgang said about the importance of progressives uh, not being in favour of, of every government program just because it's a government program. Uh, one of the things we've been uh, saying in Australia as a Labor opposition uh, is that the government's wage subsidy scheme has been poorly targeted. Uh, the Australian government has spent around $100 billion on a wage subsidy scheme called JobKeeper, uh, the largest ever one-off government program in Australia's history. Uh, and uh, much of that money has been well spent, it saved businesses and it saved jobs, uh, probably around 700,000 jobs in a country of 25 million. Uh, but there's also been uh, some pretty poor administration of the scheme, which has seen a large uh, amount of the, uh, the money go to firms whose profits increased uh, because you could get JobKeeper based on a forecast downturn which in some cases never eventuated. So some firms said, I think we're going to do worse. They in fact did it a whole lot better uh, and then they haven't been asked to pay the money back. At the same time, JobKeeper is set to end at the end of this month and a whole lot of small businesses could well go to the wall as a result of it. So it's just a, a little microcosm of, uh, of where in Australia progressives are making the case uh, that this, uh, this important government program shouldn't have gone so much to supporting the shareholders of large, large firms, uh, in some cases billionaire shareholders that have benefited from the wage subsidy scheme, and at the same time that the scheme needs to be extended to support small businesses in struggling areas that are reliant, for example, on international tourism. Uh, regions like Cairns are, are very hard hit uh, and are going to need that, that support uh, well past the end of March. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, on, on that same vein, I was going to touch into, you, you've both kind of touched on this idea, but but why is this such an important topic now? Uh, Andrew touched on why uh, when, when a government program goes to uh, billionaires or to successful companies that didn't need the help, that they should be the ones uh, maybe paying it back. We've actually said the same thing in Canada 
that uh, similarly, we've got uh, support programs that ended up going to companies that, that actually paid out dividends. So we know very clearly if a company is paying out dividends, clearly they're profitable, they're in a position to pay out a dividend. Well, then why did they access public help? So similarly, uh, there is, again, that fairness piece. Well, why are these companies that are actually making profits getting public help when we know that there are certain companies that are struggling and certain sectors that are harder hit, like the tourism sector, uh, as Andrew was alluding to. So uh, the question of why now, why in this moment is it important for us to be talking about a fair taxation system? Uh, both of you have touched on this, but maybe we can get into a bit more depth of why is this moment? Well, you know, why now and why here in this moment in time, it's so important. I'll just add to, to start it off that uh, I think more than ever, there is really a, a massive question that comes to light coming out of any difficult time where we've seen in the past governments can choose between continuing the help or cutting back the help. And that austerity really will end up exacerbating the inequality that we see. So I think it's, it's crucial that people who are worried about how we pay for this, we answer that question by saying, by making the taxation system fair, by making the people at the very top, those that have profited, they should be the ones that, that contribute their fair share. And it answers that question. It also alleviates the worry of austerity, which will be very painful in terms of cutting the help that people need coming out of an already difficult time. But uh, let's go to Andrew maybe first on this one, just to mix up the order. But uh, why do you think now and why here in this moment is the idea of, of, of taxation fairness so important? Uh, it's important, I think, Jack, mate, because of the way in which COVID has exacerbated inequalities. Uh, so if you're at the top of the income distribution, chances are you have the kind of job where you could work from home. Uh, you're able to socially distance and uh, uh, in many cases uh, you've, you are less likely to be exposed to the virus. Uh, but if you're a, uh, a cleaner or a security guard, uh, you can't work from home. And so COVID has had a, a disproportionate impact there. Uh, we've also seen, as usual in recessions, that those who lose their jobs first are those with uh, fewer skills uh, and that uh, as schools shut down, uh, it's uh, affluent families that have set up education pods to make sure their kids didn't miss out, but at the same time, disadvantaged kids have lost the most from the school shutdowns. Uh, and internationally, I, we've got, seen a, a great widening of inequality as a result of COVID. Uh, the World Bank predicting that the share, the number of people in extreme poverty um, could go back over a, a billion uh, for the first time in, uh, in nearly a decade, uh, and that some countries may not be fully vaccinated until 2024 or later. Uh, so with all of that rising inequality as a result of COVID, it is important to see what levers we can pull in order to uh, rein in the, the excesses of, uh, uh, of inequality. Uh, and making sure the taxation system is fairer is an important part of that. Uh, just one more thing on, uh, on tax havens. I've been uh, heavily influenced by the work of Gabriel Zuckman, who estimates that about four-fifths of the money in tax havens is there in breach of other countries' laws. Uh, that's important because it means that we're able to close a tax loophole while relying on basic principles uh, that no person of decency should support. Uh, so while we're uh, allowing people to stash their money in jurisdictions uh, in, in breach of, uh, of OECD, OECD countries' tax laws, uh, then that, uh, that violates not just egalitarian principles of the left, uh, but the notion of the rule of law, which uh, uh, ought to be a value that, uh, that all parties hold to. Uh, so I'm optimistic that that allows some uh, in increase in the corporate tax base that's been steadily eroded as production has moved from being production of physical goods, whose location is hard to hide, to production of intangibles, uh, such as the goods produced by uh, uh, the FANGs or GAFR or whatever acronym you want to use for the big tech companies, uh, where the, the location of production is more easily moved around uh, in order to minimize tax. Really fair, Wolfgang. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, on the question of why is that the moment, I think it's it's two notions. One is the fairness one, and and people realize that um, that there is an, a rising inequality, and and taxation, obviously redistribution, is is um, the tool to answer to that. 
And the second one is, I think, that people realize there is a need for investment. And we, we saw that in this pandemic, that you need a functioning infrastructure, be it local health authorities, be it um, hospitals with uh, proper equipment, respirators, uh, professional um, uh, personal protection equipment. Um, so I think these two elements um, brought the question up again. Um, and also um, 20 or more years of austerity that had an impact on, on how our infrastructure looks. Um, and then to tap on what Andrew said and to follow up, um, what we are doing at the OECD level in the so-called inclusive framework at the moment um, is, is actually talking about and negotiating the question of a fairer international tax system. And I, and this has something to do politically with COVID, obviously, as the GAFAs, if you want to put it like this, um, all the big tech companies are actually benefiting. Now, we are using video conference tools now, and normally people use one that is um, connected with companies um, or cloud services that make a um, billion. So I find it interesting that um, you see a, a, a support over the whole range of political um, parties. So you have the UK was a conservative government, you have France was a liberal government, and you have in Europe now, and you have um, Spain with a socialist government, and all of them are pushing um, for a digital um, taxation or on the international level, or if that won't work on the national level. But that is what, what I feel, and now obviously with the new US administration, um, we see in the, in the G20 that there is a momentum for such a political international solution. And that's something that um, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, I think there would have not been a majority for such a move. And, and that's progress. And I like that. That's great. Uh, thank you both, Andrew and Wolfgang, for that. Uh, so now let's talk about how we can actually make this happen. We've, we've, Wolfgang touched on the fact that there is, there is this desire to start taxing the web giants, to start taxing these tech companies. Uh, Andrew touched on the idea that you know now that uh, tech companies can move their location very easily to avoid taxes, and they're doing so. Uh, and they're doing so at the cost of local businesses. You know, we know that Amazon and that business model, where they don't pay their fair share, has certainly been effectively a subsidy. They've been subsidized in a way by not paying their fair share. And a part of the their success is not just because they have a, a superior model, but they've been subsidized because they're not paying their fair share and contributing to the to society. So, uh, what do we need to do to win this battle to actually? bring about the fair taxation. Um, one of the things that, that we are doing here in Canada is really building on the momentum that we need to answer the question, who pays for this? And it certainly shouldn't be, when we direct this to people, it shouldn't certainly be you or your families. It shouldn't be the people that lost their jobs. It shouldn't be workers. It shouldn't be small businesses that have been forced to shut down. So who should pay for this? Uh, who should help bear the cost? Well, those that have profited, those at the very top. And building momentum around that uh, building on the political or the, the people that desire this to happen and then translating that into action. Um, that's what we're trying to do in Canada, really build on the momentum that we can invest in the things that people need. We can tax those at the very top and we can contribute to a better society. Uh, so what do you think we need to do to win this battle to actually achieve fair taxation? Um, We'll, we'll go with uh, Andrew. Please uh, tell us your thoughts. You started touching on it with um, with some and, and Wolfgang as well with some of the the work we can do internationally. But what do we need to do to win? Yeah, I think uh, as you say, it's about building that popular campaign. Uh, the union movement has been very strong on this and uh, uh, steadily making the case that if you want a strong social safety net, uh, then you can't let multinationals get off scot free. Uh, and I think we uh, we had a, a, a sense uh, a, a decade ago that there was a real race to the bottom in corporate taxation across the OECD. Um, that's now turning around with both the Biden administration uh, and the Johnson administration in the UK talking about raising corporate tax rates. Uh, there was also the, the an interesting uh, shift as a result of the Trump tax changes uh, of setting a, a, a base, uh, setting a floor on the deductions that could be claimed for 
uh, taxes paid by US, uh, by US based multinationals. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to get the details wrong, but effectively uh, what, it, uh, what it said was that there was a flaw. I think it was two thirds of the US corporate rate. Uh, and if you went below that, you basically had to pay uh, that floor amount. So it ended up at around 16%. Uh, but that notion that we shouldn't simply uh, allow multinationals to, uh, to, to uh, deduct at whatever rate they like in any other country uh, is, I think, important. And then uh, move, you, you begin to move to the idea that across the OECD, uh, there is a kind of norm as to what is an appropriate floor corporate tax rate uh, for other, other jurisdictions to charge. Um, the uh, OECD G20 uh, BEPS process has been important in terms of providing an intellectual framework, uh, but it doesn't answer your question, Jack Mead, as to how you uh, build the, uh, the, the consensus in the streets. And I think you do that uh, case by case uh, by pointing to individual firms who haven't paid their fair share. Uh, in uh, Australia, transparency has been important for this. Uh, just getting more disclosure around uh, the corporate tax that's paid by significant, significant entities. Recognising that uh, progressives welcome profitable businesses, profitable businesses uh, employ more people, they allow higher wages to be paid, they create the potential for much greater investment. Uh, but uh, simply because you're profitable, you shouldn't have an entitlement to pay less tax than a small business down the road. Uh, so we need to get that sense of uh, equity acro across firms uh, and equity between domestic and uh, multinational firms. Uh, I've, uh, I've used your technique, Jagmeet, as, as well, of, uh, of saying uh, who in this, uh, this room has uh, money stashed in the Cayman Islands. Uh, the answer is typically uh, no one puts their hand up. Uh, but it turns out that if you look on a per Australian basis, uh, there's a surprising amount stashed in places like the Bahamas and the Caymans. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, a very small number of people are using these, uh, these tax havens. Very small number of firms are, uh, are using tax havens in order to, uh, to avoid tax. Uh, and you know, it's, uh, the, it's not just the use of, uh, of the Caymans. Uh, jurisdictions such as uh, Singapore have been used by Australian uh, resources firms as uh, so-called marketing hubs uh, in order to minimise their, uh, their tax bills in the past. Thank you for that, Andrew. Uh, Wolfgang, what do you think we need to win this battle? How do we how do we convince people to make the changes necessary to bring in fair taxation? Well, on, on the digital, I think we already won. Um, so I think now it's the question how to deliver um, actually um, the, the the solution. And and as Andrew put it, um, we are working very hard at the OECD. Um, we're going to have hopefully the solution by the summer. Um, and this will be two pillars, as, as you probably know. Um, pillar one is about the redistribution about taxation rights, um, especially because companies nowadays, as Andrew put it, um, work in a different way. And so we need to, um, to follow with our international tax system the way companies nowadays produce or create wealth with intangibles. And the second approach is a global minimum tax, um, the so-called pillar two. And that obviously will give kind of a, a bottom, a floor, and this will make the pie bigger. Meanwhile, pillar one, the redistribution um, of uh, taxation rights will redistribute um, the slices of the pie between different countries. So I think there, we 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 going to succeed because there's broad support internationally and we have the public support and we have enough pressure also on those who are still a little bit reluctant because there is many countries saying we're going to implement digital um, uh, tax digital advertising tax digital service tax however you would call it um if we 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 don't get to a a an agreement on the national level, I think it's it's more complicated. Um, they think what you said in 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 explaining and and using the argument of fairness, and also obviously um, after the crisis, talking about who will pay for the crisis. My assessment there is 
we are yet in the middle of of this COVID crisis, so probably it's it's too early to start discussing about the costs. There is a general feeling um, that this question will arise afterwards, but my political set at the moment is um, we shouldn't start talking about that question meanwhile we are in the midst of it. Um, and also the conservatives might have a point um, as many corporates are under a lot of pressure, many business owners due to the crisis because of the lockdowns, um, probably talking about raising taxes for them is not a strategy to win an election. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you both of you for, for bringing your insight. Uh, the touch, the talk of conservatives and, and what they're going to angle for is reflected by a question that came from the audience that's uh, listening in and viewing. Thanks to everybody that's that's logged in and enjoying this this chat. Uh, the question is, how do we start planning now for the inevitable conservative demand that will surface soon that we should return to, return to austerity as soon as possible? So we know that that is, there was initially a bit of that creeping up when in Canada we saw conservatives start talking about the debt and deficit. And there is still that narrative that is brewing. And I think a couple of things in Canada just to provide that perspective. Uh, people are one, we're not past the pandemic, so we're still in the middle of it. And so people aren't as receptive to these ideas about uh, coming out of the pandemic yet when people still feel we are in it. They're still seeing lockdowns happen and uh, businesses are still hurting. And there is still this uh, lack of, of confidence. People are not coming out and, and getting into stores right away. There's, there's, a, there's a, a worry that's still there. Uh, but I think it's a very fair question. I think conservatives will push this agenda. They will start talking about the debt and deficit. And, and I think the, re, the, the powerful answer that we have is, yes, we're worried about uh, how we spend. We have to spend in a responsible way. I think Andrew really mentioned that the idea of spending responsibly, making sure we invest in the right investments that help people out and not letting uh, things like uh, pro public programs go to shareholders of wealthy companies or to the executives. So being very strict about that, I think, is key. Um, and, and secondly, really doubling down on, on, on the fact that there are those who've done well and we can, we can actually increase revenue. In Canada, we're the only party talking about revenue, only one saying that to deal with the, the the massive concerns in front of us, we do need to look at revenue, but let's make sure we look at that revenue from companies like Amazon and Netflix and Google and Facebook. And let's look at those who have profited extremely uh, from this pandemic and make sure they're the ones that are paying. And that seems to be a, a good response to that question. But maybe from uh, an international perspective, what do you say to the question about this fear of conservatives pushing the austerity agenda again? And do you think that'll take hold in, in either of your regions? Um, starting with Wolfgang. Obviously, there is a danger that this will happen, especially in the broader context of the European Union. Um, but the feeling at the moment is that people really appreciate what a strong welfare state could do. No? Um, starting from what we call short-term work allowance, furlough laws that made sure that people received money and meanwhile, the companies were shut down um, from um, subsidies to um, smaller businesses um, to the general question of having an unemployment um, um, insurance in place. And then to local health um, administration that was um, tracking down and tracing infections to hospitals that could cope with the amount of infected people and, and hospitalized people. So this this idea of um, a slim state and cutting down the state, I think, as Andrew put it, um, nobody would follow, hopefully, Maggie Thatcher and, and Ronald Reagan with their themes at the moment. So in that regard, I'm not so worried um, because we can prove why a functioning state well-funded um, is necessary and also delivers, um, to, 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 to use the Tony Blair approach, delivers actually good results. And, and people realize that um, during um, the pandemic. Thank you for that, Wolfgang. And uh, Andrew, thoughts on uh, the fear of a return to conservatism, this idea of austerity, which 
can sometimes come out of difficult times? We, we may have lost Andrew, uh, that's okay. We'll, uh, there's another question actually in the chat that we can touch on and then we'll come back to Andrew. Uh, this question is, uh, I'm actually very curious, uh, as Wolfgang is right now in, in the Ministry of, of Finance, the question is about, can you help us debunk some of the arguments around um, the, that people will just move wealth if you try to tax it, and the argument that there is simply uh, not much you can raise in terms of revenue by going after uh, the extreme wealth uh, or taxing the wealthy. So uh, maybe you can also include in that there is this notion that maybe closing the loopholes or, or ending offshore tax havens won't really work, that the companies will find another way to avoid paying their fair share. Uh, any thoughts on that? And then I'll give uh, a Canadian perspective. But, but Wolfgang, thoughts on how uh, we can answer this question, debunking the argument that you know, taxing wealth or closing these loopholes won't really raise much money anyways. Well, one of one of the answers obviously is international cooperation. So, if you, for example, have, uh, now you're negotiating at the OECD level in Pillar Two, this uh, global minimum tax, then it doesn't really matter where you move in this uh, case your company because you will be taxed everywhere at a minimum level. Um, and and the second one is, I think we've come quite a way. Um, this argument would have been valid probably 10 years ago, but um, Andrew mentioned BEPS, which is the acronym for Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, um, which is a project um, impulsed by the G20 and the OECD in the so-called inclusive framework, where over 150 countries cooperate, um, had some projects on this base erosion and profit shifting that effectively um, tackled this problem that individuals who would be taxed in Germany would then move to, let's say, Switzerland, as it happened in the past. So by actually having these international cooperation and going after tax havens um, and, and countries uh, putting them on a list, blacklist or gray list, we have it in the EU, we have it with the Financial Action Task Force on money laundering. We are closing down on these tax havens and loopholes so that people can't just move around. And then what, what we in, in Germany are thinking on, on the, the wealth um, tax is um, a wealth tax that, um, that you can't escape because most of the wealth um, is also in form of, of um, uh, property. And, and obviously, if, if you tax property, it's very difficult to move that and shift that to another country um, because, because normally you like to live. Um, and when we tax you where you live, it's difficult to escape that one. Okay, I really appreciate that, that Wolfgang. Thank you for that. So just to get Andrew up to speed, one is I think the argument for why we need to have uh, make sure the wealthiest pay their fair share so we can invest in broadband. I know in Australia, that's been a, an ongoing challenge, uh, high-speed internet. When I was there, it was a big debate. So maybe that is still a problem. But we're, now we were just answering questions, Andrew, from the audience. And, and one of them was um, to debunk this myth that that, uh, well, you can't really raise much money by going after the, the wealthiest or that closing loopholes or these uh, offshore tax havens won't really raise much money anyways. Um, any thoughts on debunking that? And I'll, I'll provide the Canadian perspective after you, Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jack, mate. It, it wouldn't be a video call if uh, someone didn't drop out at some point. So I feel like <laughs> I, I just had to uh, serve that role for you all. Uh, and as you say, we... Uh, uh, when, when we last had a Labor government, our plan was to uh, roll out fibre to the premises for all Australian households. The Conservatives got in and decided that they would take fibre to a box down the street. And uh, uh, that has both equity and efficiency costs, I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, I, one of the things that always strikes me about inequality is that the typical person thinks that there's much less of it than there really is. So if you do surveys about wealth inequality and you say, uh, what, do you, what do you think the uh, top uh, fifth of the population should have? What should the bottom fifth of the population have? And what is the reality? Uh, then you very quickly discover that the typical American 
desires a wealth distribution that is more egalitarian than you see in Scandinavia. Uh, people simply don't, re don't realise how skewed the wealth distribution is. In Australia, the top fifth have about two thirds of the wealth. In the US, I think it's about, they have about four fifths of the wealth. And in both places, the bottom fifth have less than 1% of the wealth. Uh, so once people get a better sense of that, then uh, I think that's a, a useful way of opening the conversation around tax loopholes. Uh, one of the discussions we're having here too is about taxation of real property uh, and the fact that uh, a lot of the real property taxation is done on a transactions basis. Uh, so uh, uh, we tax people when they buy and sell homes, but land tax tends to be uh, a, relative, a relatively small share. Uh, and the result of that is that the real property tax burden is borne disproportionately by young people looking to break into the housing market. Uh, and so there's been a, uh, a steady push for states and territories to move away from transaction taxes, which impede mobility and fall disproportionately on the young, uh, towards land taxes, uh, which are harder to evade uh, and considerably more equitable. Thanks, Andrew. And Wolfgang did touch on that as well, the idea of taxing property directly. Uh, from the Canadian perspective, a couple of things. We had our proposal to tax the those who've got fortunes of over $20 million. Uh, we looked at that and, and there was an, a couple of thousand families that, that would fall within this category. Um, and we had the, the independent parliamentary budget office take a look at that and evaluate what would that generate. And they were able to find that on a, on a very modest level that it could raise about $70 billion over 10 years. And we chose the 1% because some econ economists gave us the advice that at a 1% tax, it would be more costly uh, to move that wealth than to just simply pay it. So uh, we're very confident that we can generate wealth this way. Uh, I think some great ideas around international cooperation would certainly make sure we can actually generate some good revenue. Uh, some other interesting ideas coming out of France was the idea of directly taxing the revenue itself. And France is proposing a tax of 3% on some tech giants and, and web giants, just tax the revenue directly, which in some cases might raise more than, than even a corporate tax approach. So there's ways to do this. It's simply, I think, a question of will to do it. And uh, I think you hear on this chat that we certainly have the will to do it. Um, I'm going to go to one more question before we go to the wrap up. Um, and uh, just quick kind of rapid fire if you can, and these questions are not necessarily the most conducive to rapid fire, but if as much as you can, so you can wrap up quickly and then go to the next segment. Um, where, where can we attach fair taxation to transforming our economy to one that is fair and more inclusive for everyone? So really what, what, what importance would you give to the idea of fair taxation to creating a more inclusive and fair economy? Um, Please take it away. We'll go to Andrew, just in case you lose that connection. <laughs> I think tie it to the uh, popular parts of spending. So we know that the, uh, the surveys consistently report that spending on health care is uh, uh, the, the most popular part of the budget, followed by education. Uh, and we've seen government money being spent very well in providing a vaccine rollout across advanced countries. Uh, you might have thought a decade ago that uh, people would be asked to pay for the vaccine, but uh, almost everywhere that I've seen, uh, this has been a, a publicly provided good, recognising the, the positive externalities. If I get vaccinated, that's not just good for me, it's also good for my family, my neighbours and the broader community. Uh, so if we uh, clearly link that no those notions together, that's important. Uh, but I agree before with what uh, Wolfgang said, uh, the debt does matter. Uh, we simply need to ensure that a return to surplus across advanced countries uh, is based on the right mix of taxation and, uh, and spending cuts, uh, not simply take a, a mindless approach that the only way of getting budgets back into surplus uh, is to cut spending. Thank you. And for Wolfgang, on this question, uh, yeah, where do you add taxation to yeah, a fair economy? I think I think everybody gets it that that um, the the state, the government, we, the communities, we need some revenues, and the way we raise revenues is through taxation, and and then it's the question that people realize where the money is is needed and spent for, and 
my feeling is, at least in Germany, where we have a very well-developed um, social welfare state, that people are happy with it and they know that they have to pay for it, both in um, social security contributions um, for our insurance system and and on taxation. And so it's it's this: if if the state provides, if we deliver good services, then people also don't think that paying taxes is such a bad thing. Um, I think it gets complicated when you have the feeling that you pay for something um, that is not good and where services are bad. So um, my feeling at the moment, at least here in Germany, is um, that people are quite happy and they understand that we need tax for redistribution, but also for raising money to invest into the, the, the society uh, and the infrastructure. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. We are running up to the end of our time here. And I just want to say a big thank you to both uh, Dr. Andrew Lee and Wolfgang Schmidt. Of course, Wolfgang uh, coming in from Germany and Andrew from Australia. Really, really enjoyed having a conversation with you, with you both. Thanks for taking the time out. Uh, as Wolfgang was saying earlier, over lots of different time zones here, we've been able to come together. So uh, we are just going to wrap this up. And I, I just want to, again, highlight uh, there seems to be a really strong solidarity across the world with progressives who see that there is an opportunity now for us to tax, to, to have a fair taxation system, and uh, whether that includes uh, closing loopholes and offshore tax havens or directly taxing the wealth. I think to the last question that we read off, I think it's inextricably tied to a fair and more inclusive economy. An economy that benefits everyone has to ensure that those who've got the most wealth are actually contributing their fair share and not the way that currently stands where if you've got the most wealth, then you find the most excuses not to pay your fair share. That's certainly got to stop. Uh, and we, we heard a lot of uh, really exciting and interesting ideas uh, from both Andrew and from Wolfgang around uh, international cooperation, the work we can do to close offshore tax havens, how this could increase revenue significantly, how progressives are going to tie this revenue to programs that actually help people and how we've shown that throughout this pandemic that governments have been a force for good, that when governments make the right decisions and invest in people, we see immediate, immediate outcomes. And the most obvious one being the vaccine rollout in a lot of countries that is being done by governments and the fact that governments can achieve this type of uh, outcome where people are going to be safer because they're vaccinated really gives more credence and more confidence in the idea that if we are able to use revenues the right way, we can actually build a fairer society. So I'm really excited by this and, and I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion and this work. Uh, we've already shared some information and I look forward to continuing our conversation as international allies on the journey of building a fair, not just country for each of us, but a fairer world. And I look forward again to this movement continuing and, and fair taxation being uh, a foregone conclusion. And we talk about how we can then invest those into people. So thank you so much again, uh, both uh, Wolfgang and Andrew. And I, I want to throw Real now pleasure. to Thank you, Andrew and Wolfgang. Mm -hmm.